training here in Singapore, and I've been working on an interesting sequence that I wanted to share with you guys, which involves the use of outside and inside positioning with our legs. Uh, you hear a lot of debate online about outside versus inside positioning, especially when it refers to like leg entanglement entries. Should I use outside positioning to enter into the legs? Should I use inside positioning to enter into the legs? In my opinion, there's advantages and disadvantages to both. I don't like the idea of viewing just one as inherently superior to the other. I have my preference, which is inside positioning. I think there are more advantages to that most of the time, but I think outside positioning has advantages too. Okay, so in this sequence, we're going to look at using a, a bit of both. Actually, we're going to use outside positioning. We're going to talk about the purpose of that, and we're going to use inside positioning. We're going to discuss a little bit the purpose of that as well. Okay, so. We're here in a to, you know, open butterfly guard situation. My opponent is going to look to gain uh, a body lock. So he's, he's looking at it as sort of a, a body lock to pass through, right? So he wants inside position of my hip. So as he comes towards me, I'm going to fall to my right hip, bring my knee towards my shoulder, and I can either hold his wrist or his elbow to make sure he can't get his arm over this knee to gain inside position, okay? So I'm here. Now the next thing I want to do is, if he's cross-facing me, I would probably attack the arms, but let's assume that that's not happening. He's a little bit higher. I'm going to reach underneath and grab his toes with my right hand. Okay, see this grip that I have here? Okay, now the strength of this grip is it's very, very strong. The weakness of it is that there's not a lot of things I can do with it other than holding onto the foot, right? Um, but it's very good for what we're initially trying to do, which is just to get a solid grip on his foot. Okay? His best way to strip this is to extend it. When he extends it, I can just go right into a scoop grip, so it doesn't really matter. A scoop grip is going to be a more, more uh, robust grip. There's more things I can do with it. But initially, I like to grab the toes here like so. Okay, now there's a lot of things I can do with this right foot. What we're going to do is I'm going to take it out and put it to the outside. Okay? Now, he's most likely expecting a K-guard style attack. Okay? Right where I would go here. Into an outside read, right? So, one thing people will look to do to style that style of attack is he's going to pick his knee up and put it inside like so. Now, this can make it hard for me to pass off to the other side and get that K guard, which the K guard attack is completely outside positioning based, all right? So, what I do from here is I take this left leg, I'm going to pummel the shin in front of his shin. So, I have a shin on shin. So, push up just a little bit so you can see. So, see what I'm doing with my shin here, guys? All right, now I'm going to take my left hand. I reach through, and I grab either his calf or something uh, on his ankle. Okay, just this general area that's all I need. Okay, from here, it's very hard for him to knee cut, because I've got that uh, basically shin on shin position with my left leg, and this leg here is acting as a wedge as well. So if I'm going to turn, and it's very easy to shoot my left leg through, okay? You now I've got a combination of an outside positioning and an inside positioning based entry. Here I throw the leg over the top, and we have a far hip ashi. Okay, the standard attack from here involves putting pressure to the back of the knee to expose the heel for the outside heel hook. Okay, but sometimes uh, you're, you're going you're gonna to struggle with that. If he's good, one thing he might try to do is plant the foot and turn the knee out. Okay, this is going to make it really hard to catch the heel because the, the foot is flat and it's hard to put pressure to the back of the knee because the angle of his knee. Okay, so something we can do, we, have, we have obviously have a lot of options, but one that I like is we take the angle, we bring it to the other side, like so. We keep, we keep our legs over there if we can. Now from here, he's either going to, don't do this, he's either going to sit down, or he's, yeah, don't do it, we'll do that next. He's either going to sit down or we're going to stay here. Okay, we're going to look at how to expose the heel in either situation. So from here, I'm going to prop myself up on my elbow like so, all right, and I turn. Now my goal is going to be to catch that secondary leg with my right hand, all right? So I go scoop it, and now from here, it's easy to pull myself behind him and do a backside 50-50, from which point it's very, very easy to expose the heel. Alright? So let's go again. So, again, we're here. He goes to that body lock. I, um, I, I make a good use of this inside position here. Alright, now I put this leg to the outside. I reach for his foot as my initial grip because it's very strong. There's a lot of things we can do with this. He doesn't want that, so he extends his leg back. And we take a scoop grip. Now it shifts the knee up, and he puts it on the inside. Okay? I take this leg, I pummel it into the shin on shin type position. Sometimes if his butt's really close to his ankle, it's hard to reach under. Okay? In those situations, I wouldn't go for this. Because if I can't grab, like, part of the calf and the ankle, there's really not much you can do here. If that's the case, I would just start extending 
uh, I would basically regain inside position here by keeping a knee shield here and extending with my right leg. See how that pushes his knee out? Okay? And then you can go back to playing K guard. Uh, but what he can do to stop that is, guys, how do you think he can stop that? It's very simple. He can lift up his butt. Yeah, so now I can't do that anymore. And now, guess what? That gives me the opportunity to go right back into what we did earlier. Right? Now I shoot through, and I come initially to this front hip hockey. He makes a good move by planting his foot and pointing his knee up. This can be really, really hard to turn him. It's really, really hard to put pressure to the back of the knee now. Okay, so alternatively, I can swim underneath. Now this creates a weightless foot. It's pretty hard for him to keep weight on the foot now. There's a lot of ways I can pass it over to the other side. Okay? Now assuming he doesn't fall down, what I'm going to do is I prop myself up on my own thigh, come up on my elbow. Okay, now I'm going to basically go onto my right shoulder and reach to that secondary leg. Okay, now I pull myself into a back set 50 50 and I catch the heel. Okay, now let's look at another scenario where this time, yeah, I'm just going to speed up. Now we're going to look at another scenario where he sits, he sits down instead of, um, you know, up. So he sat down. We are now in a position that I refer to as the opposite, uh, I, I'm in a position that we refer to as the opposite hibashi. Derek is basically in a position that uh, in the past we call like a honey stick. The 10th planet guys call this position uh, a honey stick, right? He can attack outside the building, right? So this can be strong for him, but I really like this position from my perspective, and I think there's a lot of productive things we can do here so long as we are aware of the threat of the outside heel hook, the ankle lock, and the toe hold. Okay? Um, this is a very complex position. There's a lot of different things that can happen. Let's go over a very basic scenario. If he crosses his legs, okay, so he's crossed his legs like so. My left foot's on the inside, my right foot's on the outside. The first thing I want to do is make sure my knee is pointing to the outside and I'm curling with my heel. Okay, now I'm going to reach underneath. Make a scoop grip on the secondary leg, and heel exposure is very, very easy to attain. Okay, this is not—it's not difficult to gain heel exposure here. Now, this is a super strong breaking position because I'm able to regulate his ability to raise his far hip, right? So to resist the force of rotational breaking mechanics, what he wants to do is he wants to raise his far hip. Okay, because the opposite body enables me to keep my leg on the outside when he goes to raise the far hip, it's pretty difficult, right? I can curl and point the knee out, and if I really need to, I can step on the hip. Now here, when he goes to raise the far hip, it's very hard to do. Obviously, to some degree, he's still going to be able to raise it, but the reality is it's, now it's a battle between my breaking mechanics and his defense, and uh, it's, it's a race here, right? And because I'm slowing him down in the race, I'm likely to win it and tear his ligaments before he's able to start spinning to escape the position, okay? So one more time, just for the Bashi. So from here, uh, you can have the foot inside, sometimes you can have it outside as well, right? Uh, there are advantages to both, okay? But let's just assume that now we have it inside. I point the knee out and I curl the leg, all right? Now I go underneath the knee with my second, uh, sorry, with my hand, underneath the knee of his secondary leg. My left hand grips his ankle with the primary leg. Very simple, we pull into heel exposure here. He wasn't hiding the heel, all I had to do therefore was separate his legs. Okay? If he hides his heel, that's a different battle and there's different things you're gonna have to do. Okay, but um, that's outside the scope of what we're talking about today. So from here, I've got the heel exposed in the opposite hibashi. For me to finish a rotational break, you could go for a lateral break, that's definitely possible too, but to finish a rotational break, I wanna regulate the height of his far hip. The opposite hibashi is in my opinion one of the best positions to perform a rotational break from because you have a really good ability to regulate the height of that far hip. As he goes to raise that far hip, I can sit him down either by stepping on it or simply by curling into it. Now when he goes to raise the hip, it's pretty difficult. And as he's we're gonna do that, obviously I'm applying my heel hook and I get the break. Alright, so next uh, I'm gonna go through this is the next uh, part of the video is gonna include a, a match where I'm gonna break down uh, a similar sequence. It's not identical, but it's pretty similar. It's the same basic positional flow. There's some differences, but I think you guys will see the, uh, the comparisons we try to draw. Alright, so now we're going to look at a match where uh, we can analyze a lot of the things we just looked at. So this is an old Grappler's Quest match of Gary Tonin's, uh, all the way back in 2013. So we're going to skip to the part that's, that's relevant to what we're talking about. Alright, <clears throat> so first of all,
Let's look at the guard that Gary has here. So he's got a, a Z guard, uh, and his opponent has threaded his arm through. All right. Now the next thing Gary's going to look to do is make a scoop grip with his left arm. All right, and he's framing with his right arm. Okay. Now take note of the fact that in this Z guard, Gary's uh, right leg is on the outside and his left leg is on the inside. Okay. We call this a floating Z guard now. So Gary had uh, one leg outside, one leg inside. All right. He made a scoop grip with his left hand and he, ele he elevated his opponent and brought his hips underneath him. Right. So Gary's hips underneath his opponents are what enable him ultimately to elevate the guy. All right. Now from here, he takes his left leg and he brings it over the top. Okay. Keep him, you know, in mind, uh, in this case, his right leg is still on the outside. All right. That, uh, that enables him immediately enter and do what we call a far hip ashi, all right? Uh, a far hip ashi is, uh, it's a, a position that enables you to put pressure to the back of the guy's knee, okay, in order to force heel exposure. It, it, basically, if the guy can put his heel flat on the mat, right, you can plant your foot flat on the mat, bringing your heel down, you can't expose the guy's heel, right? So what you can do to stop that is you put pressure to the back of the knee that turns the guy's body away from you, okay? especially his knee, turns the knee away, and in doing so, it brings the heel off the mat, enabling you to gain heel exposure. All right, the downside to it, as with all outside positioning-based uh, leg entanglements or guards, is that there is some possibility of being countered, right? So here, we're going to see his opponent grabs an ankle lock. He's going to pursue an ankle lock. He's got a reverse figure four grip going for the ankle lock on Gary, okay? Now, that's the downside, right? You can get countered. The thing is, there are big advantages to it as well. Outside positioning is always going to enable you more effectively to retain his knee within your knee line. Okay, that's what you're looking for when you're trying to, you know, leg lock people, right? If they can get their knee out of your knee line, well, you can't leg lock them. And there might be a few exceptions to that rule, but for the most part, it holds true, especially, obviously, with heel hooks, right? So that's a big advantage. So here, Gary's, uh, because he's got... In this case, his right leg to the outside, when he puts pressure to the back of the knee, he's going to be able to much more effectively be able to keep the guy's knee within his knee line. However, in this case, actually, he doesn't even put pressure to the back of the knee. He does what we did in the in the technique portion. He passes the leg to the other side. Now, he's no longer in a far hip ashi. He's in what I call an opposite hip ashi. All right? so an opposite hip ashi is just, you know, you got 50-50, and then your legs are on the opposite side. That's an opposite hip ashi. You could say, why isn't the outside Senkaku an opposite hip ashi? Because it needed a new name, all right? <laughs> That's all there is to it, guys. All right, so now he's in the opposite Hibashi. Now from here, his opponent is still looking for... Uh, this basically now is turned into uh, an Aoki lock, but it's just not a very strong one. And Gary, by contrast, is able to expose his opponent's heel, and he gets a super strong uh, finish. All right, now let's, let's look at this a little bit. The opponent doesn't really cross his legs, okay? So Gary's able to go right back and gain heel exposure immediately. As soon as uh, they land here, right, so he passes the leg off to the other side, and he comes down to this seated position. His, his, Gary's opponent here really had, he had two possible defensive options, okay? And this is the case with really all joint locks. You can either, uh, with joint locks, you can either use your secondary limb to cover your primary limb, right? So if you cross your legs in a 50-50, right, that's going to keep you safe. Alternatively, you can misdirect the pressure in such a way that it's not directly going into the joints. For instance, if you're in a, an arm bar and you do a hitchhiker escape, you're misdirecting pressure away from the part of the joint that the pressure is going to cause a break in, right? So with a heel hook, you can do that by hiding your heel, right? If you hide your heel, not only are you misdirecting pressure, you're quite simply like stopping the guy from even putting pressure into the knee, right? You're hiding your heel, therefore he can't start putting contrary forces into the knee, right? He's only, he has the entanglement, but he doesn't have the heel exposure, so he's unable to generate contrasting forces and therefore break the leg. However, in this case, Gary's opponent didn't do either. Didn't cross his legs and he didn't hide his heel. Obviously, right away, Gary's going to be able to gain heel exposure. Okay, now, the reason this opposite hip ashi is such a strong breaking position is because one of the last ditch things that Gary's opponent could have done here is he could have raised his hip and spun, okay? I'm sure you guys have all seen that sort of a thing like a hundred times, right? But because his legs are on, basically, on the, uh, the, the opposite hip, he can't raise that hip and he can't spin, right? You're putting his hip down, 
okay? So Gary is therefore able to put pressure through the back of the knee and then dr uh, drive his elbow into the guy's center line. That combination of forces enables you to apply ro uh, rotational braking mechanics. So let's look at that one more time. Catch the heel. Now look, he's gonna bridge through the knee, okay? And bring his elbow. See how his elbow is coming into his, his hip? Because he's driving his elbow into the guy's center line. Those combination of forces enable you to apply really strong rotational braking mechanics, all right? So anyway, guys, hope this was helpful. Uh, a lot of this stuff is going to be featured on my new instructional, which is uh, coming out. Not sure when. I'm in the process of recording it. It's going to be on basically advanced leg lock defense encounters. It's going to be the part one of two parts. This one is going to be all focused on the double-seated leg entanglement game. So anyway, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed.